in flux. It begins with what are you? Hollered from the perimeter of your front yard when you're nine, younger, probably. You'll be asked again throughout junior high and high school, then out in the world, in strip clubs, in food courts, over the phone, and at various menial jobs. The askers are expectant. They demand immediate gratification. Their question lifts you slightly off your pre-adolescent toes, tilting you, not just because you don't understand it, but because even if you did understand this question, you wouldn't yet have an answer. Perhaps it starts with what language is your mother speaking? This might be the genesis, not because it comes first, but because at least on this occasion you have some context for the question when it arrives. You immediately resent this question. Why's your mother talk so funny, your neighbor insists. Your mother calls to you from the front porch, has called from this perch overlooking the sloping yard since you were allowed to join the neighborhood kids in play. Always, this signals that playtime is over. Only now shame has latched itself to the ritual, perhaps you'd hoped no one would ever notice. Perhaps you'd never noticed it yourself. Perhaps you ask in shallow protest, what do you mean, what language? Maybe you only think it. Ultimately, you mutter, English. She's speaking English, before going inside, head tucked in embarrassment. In this moment, for the first time, you are ashamed of your mother, and you are ashamed of yourself, for not defending her. More than to be cowardly, and disloyal, though, it's shameful to be foreign. If you've learned anything during your short residence on earth, you've learned this dot it's America, and it's the 80s, and at school, in class, you pledge to one and one flag only, the stars and stripes. Greatest country on earth is the morning anthem. It's the lesson plan, a mantra. Drilled into you day in, day out, a fact as inarguable as two plus two equaling four, and what you start to hear, as you repeat this to yourself, is the implication that all other nations, though other nations are seldom mentioned in school, are inferior. You believe this. It's an easy lesson to internalize, except that your brother, Delano, your parents, nearly all your living relatives are Jamaican. When your play cousin moves from Kingston to Miami, to your Cutler Ridge neighborhood, winding up in your third grade class, refusing to pledge allegiance to your flag, you know to distance yourself from her. You say a quiet, thanks, that your last names are different. If you'd had any context for the question of what you are when it first came, you might have answered, American. You were born in the United States and you've got the paperwork to prove it. You feel pride in this fact, this inalienable status. You belt Lee Greenwood's God Bless the USA on the 4th of July. And even more emphatically, after visiting your parents' island nation for two weeks in your ninth summer. You disagree with every aspect of the island life down to the general lack of central air conditioning. You prefer burgers and hot dogs to jerked or curried anything. Back at home, your parents accuse you of speaking, and even acting, like a real Yankee. But if by Yankee, they mean American, you embrace it. I speak English, you respond. Your parents' patois and what many deem an indecipherable accent still play as normal. Almost unnoticeable against your ears, except that it is increasingly paired with the punitive. For instance, when your mother says, Anu can spill DTING on detile, but Anu can clean it? And your brother says, No me, mummy. And you say, I didn't do it, mom. She'll say, Dan who did? Muse be a duppy. The duppy becomes the scapegoat for all the inexplicable activity that takes place in and outside your house. The duppy broke your mother's vase, then tried to glue it back together. The duppy hid your brother's report card underneath his mattress. The duppy possessed your father, dragged his body out for drinks after work, and didn't bring him home until morning. A duppy, or ghost, or even a grown man, can be difficult to discipline, so you and your brother alone share the punishments. In school. When your world geography project is announced and you're made to choose from a list of countries to present on, you choose Mongolia. It's not till another student chooses Jamaica that you consider the tiny island a worthy option. Part of your project requires preparing a dish native to the country you've chosen. This is fourth grade. 
your mothers do the cooking. When they meet one another on presentation day, eyes ring dark from having wrestled with foreign recipes late into the night, they nod imperceptibly. Too exhausted for pleasantries. As your classmate begins her presentation on Jamaica, your mother sucks her teeth, a sound akin to industrial strength Velcro ripping apart, drawing glances from several of the other parents. Me could have brought in leftovers, she whispers, leaning in. If only you chose home. On career day, your father stands in front of your class and identifies himself as a general contractor. The block letter alphabet strung along the edge of the blackboard arcs over his wavy black hair. Below the arch. He unspools a foot of measuring tape with the tip of his thumb, then releases it, causing the tape to zip back into its case. The sharp was emitted by the swift violence of the retracted tape gains your classmates undivided awe. Your father repeats this action several times before deigning to speak. Your classmates hold their breath in anticipation. As he explains that when man need dem bat room fix, is me get all de plaster and PVC and TING. And is me make de worker man come nice up de place, a string of snickers breaks out from the classroom's back row. Your teacher shushes the students, but as your father continues his speech, her face crinkles, head bobbling to the beat of his patois. You concentrate on the pink surfacing over her cheeks, the color spectrum helping you determine the magnitude of this disaster. If she remains light pink, a shallow blush, a rose petal, a ballet slipper, you'll know this is a faint debasement, to be forgotten in the weeks ahead. But as her skin brightens, flashing past punch, nearing violet, you recognize this as catastrophic. You question why you didn't insist your mother come in your father's stead. She knows better how to iron out her words for American ears, as she must for work every day. Earlier in the week, you asked her about the details of her secretarial position. From the edge of your bed, your mother explained that she works in the office of a company that ships jet engines internationally. The hem of her nighty shimmied as she skipped across the room to pull down the globe from atop your bookcase. You see here. And here. And this here. She kneeled at your bedside, pointing to Germany, then Brazil, then to the chain of Hawaiian islands, singing. We go all around the world, dancing her slender index and middle fingers across oceans and lush green continents, before lifting them to tap your nose. We, you asked her. You don't get to go to these places, do you? Your mother blinked twice, then walked the globe back to its shelf. Someday, she said. Someday maybe when you're all grown up. She added, better you ask your father to visit school. Him they'll find. Exciting. In your fifth grade history section, you learn more about the founding of America. You learn about the subject referred to simply as slavery. It's an abbreviated, watered-down lesson, much like its subject heading. It's, mostly good people made a big mistake. It's, that was a long, long time ago. It's, Honest Abe and Harriet Tubman and MLK. Fixed all that nasty business. It's, now we don't see race. An air of shared discomfort infiltrates the classroom during this lesson. The students agree this was a terrible event. You're mildly aware that some of your classmates are supposed to have descended from the perpetrators of this atrocity and that some descended from the victims. You're not quite aware that many descended from both. Should you feel slighted by this country you love so dearly? This is not the first time you've heard of the transatlantic slave trade, as your father never misses an opportunity to denigrate your country of birth. In his boisterous version of the lesson, you learn that's why these black people act so, the ignorant monkeys. Them come out, oh bondage, not two seconds ago, now them must act, civilized? Boy, I tell you, white people wicked, you see. At the height of his lecture, he'll add that slavery ended in Jamaica hundreds of years before slavery ended in America. A claim you'll later learn is off by hundreds of years. He has a word, a Jamaican word, for the blacks of either nation he deems disreputable, Butu. If ever you do something that might cause him shame, he'll say. You can act like real Buddha sometimes. What am I, you've repeated to your mother by now. You've been asked enough times, by strangers, to begin seeking answers. 
Her response seems prepared, but not as clearly defined as the question demands. Your mother tells you that you are made up of all sorts of things. She lists countries, several countries, and assigns great-grand this and great-grand that to these many nations. Your mother rarely attaches names to these forebears, so you easily confuse them. Our last name comes from Italy, she says, by way of England. Most of the countries she lists are European, and though she's sure to add Africa as though it were a country or an afterthought, she never mentions race. You want a one-word answer. Am I black? You ask her. That. After all, is what you want to know. Race has descended upon your world, sudden and grating, and what you fear most is that others recognize in you something that you've yet to grasp. When only the kids asked, you assumed that their limited experience in the world left them similarly ignorant. But now adults are beginning to fish for answers. Some of your teachers simply gawk at you, while others ask how it is you speak so well. At first, you'll reply. I'm American, certain they are distinguishing between your accent and your parents. This answer only further confuses your teachers. Later, especially when asked by teachers whom your parents have never met, you realize they mean something else entirely. Are we black? You ask your mother. Agitation grips her. A shudder takes her bright, freckled flesh and wiggles it over her bones as she quickly finishes the family genealogy down to the last shaky details. Your father's father's mother was Jewish. Your grandmother's mother was Irish, she says. Your grandmother's father, and she lowers her voice to a whisper when she says this part, may have been an Arab. You stare at her blankly, noting, you haven't answered the question. Her agitation inflates to ire. Cha. I was never asked such stupidness before coming to this country. If someone asks you, she says, tell them you're a little of this and a little of that. You see that her response is final. Again, she's avoided the one-word answer, what you'd hoped was a simple yes or no. The few decidedly black kids in school find you befuddling. They are among the first to insist that you state your allegiance. Are you black? They demand. You're a rather pale shade of brown, if skin color has anything to do with race. Your parents share your hue. As do their parents. Their parents, your great-grands, occupy your family's photo albums in black and white and sepia tones that conceal the color of their skin. Some look like they might guest appear on the Jeffersons, while others look like they'd sooner be cast on all in the family. Your best school friends. Jose and Luis, are the two whose skin tones most match yours outside of your home. But when they flip back and forth, between English and Spanish, you feel excluded. And when they flip their hair back and forth in mock headbanging motions when singing your favorite rock songs, it becomes painfully apparent that yours isn't long or loose enough to bang along. Additionally, your neighbor Julie informs you that, after half a decade of friendship, you are no longer allowed to play together. Because your family doesn't believe in God. Of course we believe in God, you know enough to say. But she just shrugs and says, my dad says Jamaicans don't. Your mother tells you, and your brother one day, a new better, no bring no nappy-headed girls home. In your mother's defense, or perhaps, to further disparage your mother. Her list of girls not to bring home will stretch to the point where you'll wonder if she ever wants you to bring home girls. Don bring home no coolie, she'll start to warn in middle school. Upon seeing your uncut coffee-colored Panamanian prom date, she'll lock herself in her bedroom. For her, your mother will have no words at all. And after you graduate, she'll say, please, just not a white girl. Promise me that. But this is fifth grade still, and you're confused about this first warning. What constitutes nappy hair to your mother? You study hers, as fine as Jose's and Luis's guitar string fibers then study the cotton candy curls on your head. You wonder about your own hair's nappiness. You wonder who can't bring you home. The duppy returns, more mischievous than ever. It hides your father in a bar, in a bacchanal. In a dimension where your mother can't reach him. Before he rematerializes, plastered in jubé paint, your mother reports him missing. 
As she talks to the police over the telephone, you and your brother huddle near enough to hear the man on the line say, Ma'am, I can't make out a word you're telling me. Is there someone there who speaks English? She passes you the handset before breaking into sobs. The man asks you to describe your father. He's six foot one, you tell him. Skinny. Black or white, the man asks. You look to your brother. Not white, you say. Black, then. Brown, your brother says. Your father go missing often? How often is often? The disembodied voice tells you, ever. Oh, you say. Then too often. On the day you are scheduled to begin the sixth grade. A hurricane named Andrew pops your house's roof open, peeling it back like the lid of a Campbell's soup can, pouring a fraction of the Atlantic into your bedroom, living room, everywhere, bloating carpet, drywall, and fiberboard with sopping sea salt corrosion. It disinters the kidney-colored fiberglass from the walls and ceiling, splaying the house's entrails on the lawn. The storm chops your neighbor's house to rubble, parks a tugboat at the far end of your street. In Andrew's wake, your family flees Miami-Dade to Broward County, where your mother's company has temporarily relocated. At your new school, you again fall in with the brown boys. These boys, you come to learn, are the Puerto Ricans. One, Osvaldo, takes you under his wing. You sit with his crew in the lunchroom, and every once in a while. When they break into Spanish, you stare into your lunch trays, partitioned green peas and orange carrot cubes. If you are still enough, no one will notice you in these moments, you'll become invisible. If no one can see you, no one can realize two no and teens that you don't quite fit. Osvaldo seems aware that you don't speak the language but he's forgiving of this fault and steers the conversation back to English. Perhaps it's that you've taken to shaving your head, removing the thick curls that might otherwise peg you as different. Or perhaps you look enough like these boys, despite having a touch more Africa running through you, or perhaps they assumed you understood that at this school and at this age people stick to their own kind. Either way, it dawns on you just a beat late that these boys believe you, too are Puerto Rican. They make cracks about white people, white people smell like cocker spaniels. But only when they're wet. They take cracks at blacks, why do black people stink so bad? It's so blind people can hate them, too. Finally, one day at lunch. A member of the group asks you, not without a level of disgust, why your parents never bothered teaching you Spanish. You expect Osvaldo to intervene but he awaits your answer with equal anticipation. Because they don't speak Spanish, you say. The boys share confused glances. Your grandparents didn't teach them Spanish? My very Jamaican parents speak only English, you clarify. Wait, Osvaldo says. You're black? The trouble is not just that you've outed yourself, but that there is another set of boys with whom this group happens to be at war. The factions claim turf around the schoolyard, occasionally brawling under a nearby overpass. Your newness left you ignorant of the beef, but you're told these rivals hail from an island just two over from Puerto Rico, Jamaica. Osvaldo supplies this information as a parting gift. You are no longer welcome at his table. The Jamaicans, some of whom are in your classes, look nothing like your family or the family friends who fly up for visits. And from the skepticism you find in their faces, you're certain that you scarcely resemble anyone they hold warm feelings toward. You wonder if there are two Jamaicas. The difference can be noted in the names they and their American counterparts assign you, light bright, red nega, white boy. At times, they simply call you Spanish. Now that you've been booted from the brown enclave, your vulnerability becomes your fragile, frantic, solitary friend. Your brother, Delano, having four years of experience on you, and picking up on your ever-deepening entrenchment in this liminal space, finally clarifies things, you're black, Trelawney. In Jamaica, we weren't, but here we are. There's a one-drop rule. With a smirk, he adds, sorry to break it to you. You attempt to befriend your Jamaican classmates. 
These attempts involve enduring humiliations, including quizzes about what Jamaican cities you can name, everyone knows Kingston. That doesn't count. And what patois you can speak, you know what's a batty boy, batty boy, and what Jamaican dances you can perform, you can bogle. Show us, till it becomes obvious they will never accept you among their ranks, especially not after you spent time with the Browns. Members of both groups go out of their way to trip you in the halls or knock over your lunch tray. You disappear to the library's science fiction and conspiracy section during lunchtime. It's the one place you feel safe. This double exclusion will solidify one thing for you, you are the black sheep, if nothing else. Your brother starts traveling south, back to Miami with your father on weekends, his chafed leather tool pouch shoulder slung, like a heavyweight championship belt. His biceps grow round and taut overnight. As though tennis balls had been implanted beneath the skin overlaying his arms, forced in with a shoehorn at the crooks. Softballs bloom inside his shoulders. The skin darkens, terracotta, colored under the facial hair that's sprouted on his cheeks, his cheekbones burned ashen. Roof work, he explains. D sun wicked, you see. He says this grinning, thumb brushing his chin hair, modeling skinned knuckles. With your father's guidance, he is rebuilding, rebuilding the house, the life Andrew washed into oblivion. He is constructing manhood. They disappear Friday nights and reappear Sundays. You're told they sleep in a tent pitched in the wreckage of the living room or kitchen, depending on which they worked over that day. You beg your father to bring you on these trips, to allow you to join in rebuilding. This no picnic business, boy, he says. His decision is final, rendered before you even ask. Weekends, you sit with your Sega and kill things, vampires and aliens, and time. One Sunday night, your brother returns to your bedroom, reeking. You could scrape the salt. Sweat then left to crust, off his arms. You could pat his clothes and disappear into the plaster cloud emitted. On his breath you taste beer, warm and stew-like. He climbs to collapse on the top bunk, his tan boot dangling over the mattress's edge. You wonder if he'll make it to class the next morning, but you don't say this. You say, how much longer? You say this every Sunday night. Always, the answer is vague, placating, soon come. You translate, then repeat this to your teachers, any who will listen. Not long now, you say. Here's my homework. You can grade it if you want, but don't expect me back Monday. I'll be gone any day. Every Monday you return, they say, with us another week, Miami? You gaze into the chalkboard, forcing your vision to double over, working to deaden the expression in your eyes. In your voice. It won't be long, you say evenly. This time, how much longer, is met with your brother's yawn, it almost done. It going to be nice, brethren. Better than before. Stronger. I hope soon. I don't belong here. Thing is, Delano says. Stifling a burp in his fist, you won't go back. Not there. What do you mean I won't go back there? He pauses, perhaps sobering a little, realizing he said something he shouldn't have, then commits. Dad told me this weekend. You and Mom aren't coming with us. On move-out day. Your father shakes your hand firmly and tells you, soon, yeah? He wears an expression that suggests there should be more to say on such an occasion, but he can't bring to mind what that thing might be. Your mom can hardly tear herself from Delano, and when she releases him from her embrace, she bounds back into the apartment without a glance at your father. Your brother offers you a bunks, folding his fingers into his fist, knocking his knuckles against yours. Little more, rude boy, he says, smiling, for your benefit. It's a gesture. It's not that bad, this gesture says. Though you all recognize that it is exactly that bad. A week before the start of seventh grade, your mother moves you back down to Miami-Dade County, to Kendall, where no one is American. You might be a gringo, you might even be black American. But solidarity under the stars and stripes has ended for you. In school, 
Black girls still scream red at you when you walk through the halls. The boys still make fun of the way you speak, calling it white. You, of course, deny any connection to whiteness. You swear allegiance to blackness. It's the music you listen to now, the baggy clothes you wear. The most popular kids in your predominantly Hispanic middle school are black. They're viewed as the most charismatic, the most athletic, the least likely to give a fuck. You want in on this blackness, on its enigmatic pull. You mimic these boys. You ape the way they walk and talk. Specifically, you begin to drag your feet and limp, then bop, and limp, then bop, then limp when you walk home from school. Your new walk has less the effect of helping you blend and instead makes you stand out as having special needs, but no one gains cred beating on a disabled kid, so you keep it bopping. You begin to drag your words and cut consonants, cut entire syllables. Cause fuck em if they keeping you out the circle oh blackness. The member perks are simple, no one will fuck with you once you're a card carrier. The neighborhood gangs, comprising mostly middle class, suburban Latinos, are wary of the blacks, whom they vastly outnumber. But who have brothers and cousins and uncles in Overtown and Liberty City and in prison, who are famous for having murdered people. Being black, you realize, might save your life but somehow you keep falling short. When you do stupid shit, it's embarrassing. When they do stupid shit. It's contagious. They call each other nigga and dog. Then the Latinos say my nigga and dog, then the whites say my nigga dog, even if quietly, even if looking over their shoulders first. Even if ironically, but that's how it infects you. First you say, my bad, and giggle. Pretty soon it feels more right in your mouth than sorry. Years later, you'll see it on Friends and hear it on the nightly news. Now when people ask, what are you, the answer is simple, black. And soon enough, people start to believe you. Weekdays. Your mom leaves her office at 5 p.m. and reaches home around 7 o'clock. Her company's post and relocation to Fort Lauderdale has become permanent, inescapable. Your mother's commute threatens to steal hours from her life, so she fills these hours with speak Italian now. On cassette. Somehow it's her American accent that grows stronger. She. Collapses in front of the television at night with barely the energy to ask, are things okay with you? Things are okay with me, you say, no matter how things are. How are your grades? My grades are okay. And your friends? You making friends yet? My friends are okay. The house your mother purchased is larger than the one you grew up in, and much emptier. She spends her weekends furnishing the common areas with armchairs and artwork and rugs, but the rooms never seem to fill. A third bedroom, the one she keeps for your brother, the whole reason you moved back to Miami-Dade, goes largely unused. Although the household earnings have been halved by your father's departure, she can afford this home through the magic of an adjustable rate mortgage. It's an investment, she tells you. It's a good time to buy. I'm confused, you say. Did you buy the house, or does the bank own? It? I bought it, she says. And the bank owns it. Your father visits infrequently and takes you exactly once to his and your brother's house. On the drive down, he listens to talk radio. It's a spectacle of active listening. The show's segment is titled Race Wars. The host is saying, My money is on the Hispanics, you know, because these people have shown a remarkable ability, ladies and gentlemen, to get anywhere they want to go. To cross borders, boundaries, they get anywhere. They can go without water for a long time and they will do things other people won't. Dishes, gardening, your father slaps his knee and cackles. Ignorant monkey, he says. Before leaning in and turning the radio two or three notches louder. He smooths his mustache with two fingers, kneading the smile from his face when he notices you watching. The blacks, now, I know you're going to say this is racist, but the blacks have no chance. None. And I'll tell you why. They can't swim. It says it right here. 
Almost half of all reported drowning deaths among people aged 5 to 24 are among blacks, according to this study in the American Journal of Public Opinion. But what kind of, cha, rubbish? Your father lowers the volume. After 10 seconds or so he chuckles and says to himself, the man have a point, though. Upon entering your father's house, you see that the living room's gray, blue carpet has been replaced with bright white tile. The juice stains and stiff patches of fiber that mapped your childhood have vanished with the carpet. Most notably absent is the wall that once separated your bedroom from the kitchen. They've converted your room into a kind of dining area. A green and white lawn chair and a burgundy office chair sit on either side of the unvarnished dining table. The house is pristine, except for the coffee mugs and newspapers that litter the table's rough surface. Your brother, a junior in high school now, reclined shirtless against the lawn chair's vinyl straps, flipping through the classifieds. He's lean and ripped and looks ever more like your father's son. As you survey the interior, your father looks over your clothes disapprovingly, his ears perk up at words you do or don't use. You're unsure which, though you've used few in his presence. Boy, you gallivanting with these black pick me, he says. You look to your brother, who lifts his muscular shoulders, then sets them back in place, before returning to circling job postings. More and more you're turning into some kind of Yankee butu, your father says. Don't blame me, cause you used me for a green card, you respond. I didn't choose to be born here. You are grasping more about your position in the world. Even if you understand little about what you might do to alter it. In high school, teachers stop asking how you learn to speak so well. They stop asking much of you in general, until you're accused of plagiarism when your research paper sounds too sophisticated. You might talk and dress black, but you still write white, and there's a discrepancy to account for. Your blacksent, you realize, might get you kicked out of school. Your science teacher, Mr. Garcia, forces you to rewrite the essay to make it sound like someone like you wrote it. You rewrite your thesis, niggas be like, why for when bullets fly, niggas die. Newton says it's, cause objects in motion, be staying in motion. That was one scientific nigga, my nigga. Your revised paper earns an emphatic checkmark and a D-. In February, when teachers speak of the atrocities perpetrated against blacks in America, you nod, then dissociate, thinking, it's not my history. My family wasn't even here back then. Simultaneously, you cultivate disdain for America, though America does most of the legwork. You suspect, on some level, that this disdain functions because you believe this history is your history. Still, you hope that looking outside the United States will offer a kinder alternative to the oppression-centric narrative for people of the African diaspora. At best, what you discover are loopholes in the designation of blackness, terms like half-caste and mulatto. Semantic parachutes that might allow an escape from blackness. You reject these terms, come up with your own, half rican and negro light. When you meet boys, your color and darker, boys, with kinkier hair, fuller lips, and broader noses, who cling to their Puerto Rican or Cuban or Dominican heritage in an exclusionary way, as in, I'm not black, I'm Dominican, you join your friends in calling them sellouts. Uncle Tom, ass, self-hating ass Negroes. You want black people strong and unified, after all. But one day, after one in a never-ending string of racial injustices gets concentrated media coverage, a band of black American boys walks past, screaming Chico and Oi, and at first you stand idly, searching out their target, thinking, someone's about to get it. Not realizing it is you who will receive the sharp edge of their vengeance. A dozen dark hands ram you against a chain-link fence, shoving your body, as though pushing to strain. The blackness from your flesh, before the white that remains, can be justly smote. Before a punch lands, though. Shells, your mutual, unquestionably black friend, ambles by and gives you a pass. Nah, he's cool, Shells says noncommittally. And this is enough. How can your blackness be so tenuous? How would speaking Spanish make you not black? You want to know. 
How does being from an island in the Caribbean make you not black? No, seriously, you'll want to know this, because some of the Jamaicans in your circumference start to openly make similar claims. We're very different culturally, they say. You've heard this from your own family. This becomes popular enough that even your black American friends repeat it back to you. At the warehouse where you work, a white coworker asks you to help him nigger rig a pallet. Is that really the kind of thing you want to say to me? You ask him. What do you care? You're not black. You're Jamaican, he says. I have a Jamaican friend who explained the difference to me. You wish his friend could come explain the difference to you. Suddenly, black Americans are the only blacks. Blacker than Africans. Black in the, lowered voice, bad way. As you learn more and more about what it means to be black in America, you finally make strides to understand your Jamaican heritage. You start simple. Suddenly, you like jerked and curried everything. Your flag switches from red, white, and blue to gold, green, and black. You fill your drawers with Jamaican flag bandanas and wristbands. Your one-word answer switches to Jamaican, which you find more inclusive, all-encompassing. Plus, the times black failed to satisfy and you followed with American, the askers shook their heads and said, no, stupid. Where are your parents from? You know what I'm asking. Jamaica is the solution. Jamaican is as specific as it gets. But half the time, when you answer, what are you, with Jamaican, you're told, you don't sound Jamaican. If you're Jamaican, where's your accent? You go deep. Not shaggy, Mr. Lover Lover, radio-friendly deep. I talking Capleton, more fire, mix 96 underground radio deep. Panyard Warehouse Dance Hall, deep. Me say, me can rate rap music, less anu, say cool herc, a yardy, invented hip-hop deep. Or Biggie's mom's is Jamaican deep. And he's the best to ever do it deep. You know turn ras, but you chat, bout I and I principles deep. You know praise Celacy, but you big up Marcus Garvey, deep. You'll chant, fire pon bush, but still rate Colin Powell deep. Bully beef deep. Build a Saturday soup with Chocho deep. Unaya Marie patties and Sangos deep, like I know live pon colonial, like you live pon aki and saltfish diet deep. Fish and festival deep. Johnna cake and fritters deep. You can chat bout Sega versus Manly Deep, JLP versus PNP Policy Deep, Deep Like Red Stripe versus Heineken. I talking Bayside Hut, Heel and Toe on D Bookshelf Rhythm Deep. Deep Like, Why'd the Wayans Have to Do Us Like That? Deep. Deep Like You Root for Screwface in Marked for Death Deep. When you're out in Miami, let's say at Dolphin Mall, and the cashier addresses you in Spanish, and you say, Sorry, I don't speak Spanish, then answer the requisite survey on why you don't, you'll be offended when the cashier tells you, but you don't look Jamaican. What do Jamaicans look like? She'll rub her forefinger against the skin of her wrist, as if trying to remove a smudge, and say. Black. She promises you that you must be Dominican. When you finally move away for college, what shocks you most is how no one in the Midwest assumes you are Puerto Rican or Dominican. Here you are simply, unquestionably black. No one asks, what are you? Instead, your classmates ask what it is like to have just survived Katrina. You explain that 13 years earlier you lived through Hurricane Andrew, that Andrew was Miami's Katrina. At this, they blink and lose interest. In seminars, people want to know the black perspective on things. Their eyes flash disappointment when you say, I'm probably not the one to ask. You suspect this is always the right answer, no matter who is asked. You wonder if denying to yourself and others that you've had the typical black experience is integral to the black experience. You wonder what would have happened if a real black man had gained admittance. You envision your classmates running for their lives. You picture your classmates throwing their pale, naked bodies at his very dark feet. You wonder if another black person will ever be admitted. You watch as the years go by and none are. In the Midwest, you are unquestionably black, still, you'll marvel at just how white your skin gets in the winter. 
You'll stare for hours in the mirror at your hair, the loosened curls, newly freed from the weight of Miami's humidity. Some of it shoots straight out in singular strands, while other parts cling in wavy, feathery tufts, and still other spiral in tight coils. Not even your hair agrees on what it should be. In the halls of your university's English department, your Korean friend accuses you of perming your hair. Your white classmates yank at it in seminars, then apologize, then yank at it in bars, and don't. You thought this was just a stereotype, that the myth was grossly overblown. You are embarrassed for humanity. You stumble drunkenly out of a dive bar and into a cab one night. You tell the Somali driver, take me to black people. He nods and takes you downtown, to a hip-hop club. When you enter, you nearly tear up with joy, feeling the thumping bass vibrating through you. But when you peer into the crowd, the duochromatic pattern, the repetition of very dark men grinding against very pale women, will startle you. In the Midwest, what comes into question is not whether you are black, but whether others around you are really white. Your Chinese-American friend, Caitlin, confides in you that she feels white. What does whiteness feel like, you ask her. I imagine it's like walking barefoot on a shag rug. Oh, I forgot, Caitlin says. You must hate white people. Why should I hate white people? I moved all the way to the Midwest to discover white people. I just mean that people expect me to have some kind of minority perspective on things. Like I'm supposed to be the ambassador for Chineseness. My mom and dad are the only Chinese people I know. Plus we're so well off. I guess I feel too privileged not to be white. That must be difficult. I know how this must sound, especially to you, but that doesn't change the way I feel. You wouldn't understand. How could you? It sounds like you'd prefer if people treated you less like a generalization and more like a human being. Like how white people treat white people. She bites her lip, cautiously, then says, right. And your outward appearance is the only thing preventing this from becoming a reality. Exactly, she says. I know what you're feeling, you say. And I don't think it's whiteness. You attend what the students at your university refer to as a party. You've been to parties, of course, but here there is a distinction made between parties and dance parties. At dance parties, people have permission to dance. At parties, people have permission to stand awkwardly, discussing their studies, shielding their stomachs and chests with red plastic cups, or else bob dizzily around these cups, holding on for dear life. In Miami, as far as you are aware, all parties are dance parties. You are way behind on the learning curve for small talk. You meander through your host's crowded living room toward a partially formed circle of women whom you recognize from class. They are taking turns speaking passionately about something or other. You hope it's a topic you can contribute to. You're all English majors and transplants to the Midwest, you should have shared interests and experiences. They make room for you to complete their circle, but continue speaking rapidly, looking only into one another's eyes. One of them is saying, It's like with me, people here find out that I'm from Mexico, and they think of Mayans. My family's bloodline goes directly back to Spain. I'm no Indio. I mean, not that anything's wrong with that, but there's a clear difference. I know, the other black-haired woman in the conversation says. I'm from Argentina. We're more similar to Europeans than South Americans. It's so true, the third, a brown-haired woman, says. Just because my mother is Jewish, all of a sudden I'm treated like I'm not white here. Oh, you're white. The Mexican places a sympathetic hand on the brown-haired woman's arm. Don't worry. Ah, you're white, too, she says, returning the arm, Pat. I'm white, the Argentine says, shakily. She blinks back tears. Oh, of course you are, the other two say. We're all white. We're white. We're white. We're white, they say. You start to date two white American women, casually, simultaneously. They both happen to be called Katie. 
nearly every woman in the Middle West is called Katie. Or Caitlin. Or Catherine. Or Kathleen. But these two are Katie. They're both in their mid-thirties and seem to be going through the same crisis that led them to date you in the first place. They worry aloud about their fast-closing window of opportunity to have children. They speak carelessly about the fact that they come from wealthier families than you, they never actually ask. You're insulted. Considering how much of your scholarship and student loan money you spend on your clothing, and how much time you put into your general appearance, but ultimately you come to understand they're both right. Although they haven't outright said so, the Katies believe they are smarter than you. But that you are better looking than they are, and they're willing to trade their money and brains for your youthful attractiveness. What you don't tell them, what you keep closely guarded, is that you dicked around after high school. Performing unskilled labor for years before bothering to apply to college, that you're a handful of years older than they assume. Brown guys don't get frown lines, so you're never asked what you're doing in undergraduate classes. Besides, the Katies already have your narrative written out in their heads, and who are you to disappoint them? And what you like about them is that they're so taken by your, your what, exactly? They try to play it cool in the beginning. But soon they let slip comparisons between you and other men they've dated. Or imagine dating. These comparisons are meant to sound complimentary. Katie says, your skin's so much smoother than guys I've been with. I didn't think it could be so smooth. Be grateful you're not all ashy. Who knew your lips would be so soft? Katie says. Like plush, little pink pillows. Thank God they're not all chapped and burnt looking. Katie even says, there's pink in your nipples. Brownish pink, but pink. I didn't think that was possible. Sooner or later they each begin obsessively to insist, over and again, but you look mixed. I am mixed, you say. No, I mean biracial. Well, when you add it all up. No, they say, I mean like one of your parents is white. In a diner at one in the morning, a woman tries to sell you the Quran. When you refuse, she curses you for betraying your Arab heritage. You promise her you have no Arab heritage and that you are not Muslim. At this, she passes a hand over your face and says, of course you are. Look at you. Your two black friends in the Midwest incessantly ask what you've done to your hair to make it look so. Actually, they point to it and say, you don't wake up like this, do you? No. You don't, the other says. I wash it from time to time, you answer. They stay mad at you for dating only white girls, then for dating only Asians. They get mad at you for dating their Haitian friend. They're mad when you break up. Like anybody cares where you put your ragged a dick, Sheila says when you point this out to her. I told Gabriella not to mess with you, she adds. You're on some taste the rainbow shit. Stick another fork in black love, says Naya, whipping her head this way and that. You wonder if you're in Gabriella's love, could have qualified as black love. Your complexion is further from hers than from the Katie's. You're careful not to wonder this aloud. When Sheila and Naya notice a family photo on your bookcase, the one that includes your dad, they go apes hit. Oh, he has good hair, they say. And oh, no wonder. I thought your father was black. I thought you were just light-skinned. You want to point out their use of such a denigrating phrase as good hair, and to ask where this tribe of just light-skinned people is supposed to originate. You want to know if your father isn't black, and if his hair alone disqualifies him. Instead, you blurt, my mom's is straighter. What makes us so good? They lean in close to inspect the photograph, then pull away, laughing. Your mom's hair isn't straight, Sheila says, a string of giggles chasing her words. You look to your mother's image, at the bangs, the hair cascading over her shoulders, then to Naya, whose laughter has stiffened into a smirk. Her hair isn't really straight, she agrees. That's nothing but a perm. At the formal events you attend in the Midwest, you still manage to be surprised that the only black people present are there to serve. 
somehow you're still surprised when black staffers stop you to say, you look just like a guy who works here. Black bartenders refuse your order until you acknowledge this statement. They rush to wait on your friends and colleagues, but for you they stand idly by, smiling crookedly, as though you've told a joke, or as if they've remembered something amusing and you've said nothing to them at all. They might produce a damp rag and wipe down the bar before making eye contact. They might shuffle the ice scoop through the cubes in the freezer or stack cocktail napkins atop the dispenser, though the white paper squares are already beginning to lean. When they finally acknowledge you, they make a production of sizing you up. Their heads wag especially slowly if you're accompanied by a date. You look like a guy who works here, they say. And if you repeat yourself, if you ask, could we have two whiskey gingers, please, they'll bare their teeth, look deep into your eyes, and say in the slowest possible cadence. You look just like a guy who works here. And you'll nod. You'll nod or go thirsty. That was really weird, your date might say on the walk back to your table. She might go so far as to explain microaggressions to you. You'll take your seats, move on from this indignity. Until the waitress comes around, quietly and briskly placing plates before the other guests at your white linen clothed table. She'll save your plate for last, as seems to be the protocol. If you're not paying attention, if you're engaged in conversation, she'll tap your shoulder. Interrupt you mid-speech, and say, you look just like a guy who works here. You'll understand that she means, you look like a guy who should just work here, of course. Especially because ever since you left Miami you felt consumed by the idea that no one in this entire state looks anything like you. You wish some Dominicans would move into town. Still, on buses and on downtown street corners, drunk black men stop and point at you, saying, We're brothers. Don't you forget. In Jamaica you're brown. Your peers look overwhelmingly like you, some varied combination of African and European, with splashes of Indian or Chinese. They look like your family and sound like your family, and this makes you feel at home. Even among strangers. Your peers here recognize mixed features as common within the middle class, and for once, on this grant-funded excursion to your parents' country, the eyes on you don't question or judge, but accept. Until you open your mouth. Oh. A Yankee this, they say when they hear you. But your parents them must be yardies. Me can see it upon you. Some assure you that, no matter where you were born, you have Jamaican blood. Others, the younger ones especially. Find it preposterous that you would even utter the words Jamaican or Jamaican-American to describe your ethnicity or as any other kind of self-identifier. But what you know about Jamaica, they ask. You've been taken in by this particularly skeptical mix of men and women in their early to mid-twenties, perhaps because they feel sad that you lost out on a proper Jamaican upbringing. Or perhaps because they all seem to be home from the medical schools and law schools and universities they attend abroad, and having been away from Jamaica themselves, they need a foreigner present to remind them that they belong here. Whatever the case. They succeed in convincing you that your parents ruined your life the moment they abandoned the island. Your new companions take you for fish and festival at Hell's Higher Beach, where onyx and camel-colored bodies glisten in the turquoise water. They take you to National Stadium to see the fastest women and men alive qualify for their Olympic runs. They order their helpers to cook you jerked pork and stew peas and roasted breadfruit. They take you on boat trips and to nightclubs with names like Fiction and Envy. You count all this as research, postponing indefinitely your visit to the library at the University of the West Indies. Your companions' parents insist you meet their friends' or siblings' daughters. For the first time in your life, someone's mother, several mothers, thinks you're an appropriate match for her daughter, and you agree. You want to propose to them all to add post-haste to the caramel beige population. These are the girls your mother wanted you to bring home, you realize, these walking multiculti mosaics. These brides of racial ambiguity. Where else are people like me mass-produced? You ask yourself. And how can I ever go back? On drunken nights you try your best Jamaican accent, 
which might pass under the thumping subwoofer's base, or when everyone in your proximity is wasted. But having spent the last few years sequestered in the Midwest, away from the music and food and people so easily located in Miami, you've already lost a large percentage of your parents' tongue. At hearing your attempts, your companions crack smiles, then look away. Pretend not to be embarrassed for you. Eventually, you'll admit to yourself that you are tired. Tired of trying to convince anyone of anything, especially yourself. When you're brought to the house your grandparents owned before they died, the one you visited as a child. You realize how small it is when held up next to your memories. You realize everything is relative. One afternoon, reclining in a lounger on your host's veranda. You set aside the bottle of Ray and nephew long enough to ask two of your companions the question that brought you back to Jamaica, to begin with, the one you've come to write about. Among your friends, you begin, do people tend to think about or talk about their ancestral roots? Pre-Jamaican. I mean. You've been thinking about your mother's list of European grands and how your parents still speak so highly of the British school system that educated them, pre-independence and you think of the Rastafarians who extol Ethiopia and Mama Africa. But what you want to know about is contemporary middle-class twenty-somethings. You want to know how you might feel had your family never left. Do any of you look to England or West Africa as, you know, the motherland? But what kind of foo-foo thing you asking? Zoe. The light-eyed Browning, says. You've fallen in love with Zoe alarmingly fast. You've spent the last several nights fantasizing about penning a letter to your father, begging that he send a dowry of sorts, any financial support that might allow you to remain in Kingston and court Zoe. Should you marry her and return your line to the island, perhaps in ten, twenty years America would. Be a blip in your family history, a bad dream to be forgotten. Back in Miami. Delano and his new wife have already begun making full-blooded Jamaican babies who may or may not grow to embrace their heritage. For her part, Zoe returns your flirtations but guffaws at how slowly you speak, the grating way you bend your vowels, and how hard you land on consonants. Is A for IQ your motherland, she says in a voice that's supposed to sound like yours. Only Yankees think about these things, cause them have no culture. Them lost. So typically, you say, Jamaicans just feel. Jamaican? Zoe's cousin Stephen turns to her. Boy gone, you know. The whites lick off him head and him gone gone. And to you, ease up, man. The rum they're going mash up that T-I-N-G between your ears. Stephen's the son of a friend of a friend of your mother's who was supposed to show you around Kingston but who immediately pawned you off on Zoe and her girlfriends. You could kiss Stephen for this. You think French people don't feel French? Zoe asks. You think the Irish them don't feel Irish? That's different. You're not the original inhabitants of this island. So what? How long we must go back? You think generations never migrated throughout Europe? I'm talking about colonialism, mass enslavement. Cha. Only you Yankees hold on to that, she says. That's what separates us from all of Anu. You wonder about the relationship between ahistorical thinking and contentment. You've been surprised at how forgiving you can be of Zoe's political views. Perhaps she has a point. Or perhaps this is love, blinding. When you told her you'd like to travel up to a compound to pay homage to the Maroons who successfully fought off the British slavers, she said. You mean dem little mud, hut people? You say now, but the poor people we pass on the street, the ones living in shacks and bussing for miles to come clean your house, they can't see you all in nice cars and nice clothes and houses and think there's one Jamaica. They're still suffering the results of colonialism, no? Well, you see, some people don't want work hard, Zoe says. Me know it sound wretched to say, but... Must be you want brown people in houses, and blacks in tin huts. Class issues, brethren, Stephen says. There's no racism here. We're all black, man. You decide to press the issue no further, fearful you'll offend your hosts. But later. 
When you ask about the private security forces whose billboards litter Kingston skies, the ones who are said to arrive during home invasions and shoot thieves on sight, and how it is they distinguish between the robber and the homeowner, Stephen points out. They wouldn't shoot people who look like us. Them only shoot you if you're black black. Your re-entry into the Midwest is startling, much more jarring than when you first left Miami. You begin to feel pangs of loneliness, discontent. You realize, with bemusement at first. Then with despair that reaches like an icicle, from your diaphragm to the base of your gut, that you disagree with every aspect of life in your upper Midwestern town, from the meat raffles and tornado warnings to the tater tot hot dish and the passive aggression right down to the general lack of central air conditioning. You miss Jamaica and its people. You write to Zoe for several weeks, but the messages taper off as the fall semester gets underway. One night, you get into it with Naya and Sheila about your feelings of isolation. What do light skin tears taste like? Sheila asks. Are they hydrating? Maybe if he'd date black American women, Naya says. Where are these women? You make a show of surveying the room. There's not another in this bar. There isn't one in my whole department. See? That's your first problem, Sheila says. What kind of black man studies literature, anyway? We can't afford to have college-educated artists. We need to be building wealth in our communities. Because the world needs another MBA, you say, referring to Sheila's grad school ambitions. Or, worse, you add, turning to Naya, another lawyer. You're three deep in tequila shots and the surface of your high top is littered with beer mugs, all of which have been emptied. You look to your left, toward the bar, hoping to spot the server, to order another round. Instead, you see what, for a split second, you believe to be your mirror image. There's a very light brown young man, sitting on a stool, at the bar and as you turn toward him, he turns toward you. His hair is shorter than yours, though, and his eyes are lighter. His lips are rosy in his golden face. You would normally look away, but you keep your eyes planted on him, for the moment. Your intense interest in studying mixed people's features, in parsing what makes them like yourself, has only intensified since moving to this city that has next to none. It's like belonging to a club you're not allowed to talk about. The man at the bar smiles and approaches your table. He says his name is Justin. Justin appears to be alone. Perhaps he suffers from a similar affliction. Grab a seat, Justin, you say. We were just discussing black responsibility in the 21st century. Justin looks to your companions as though to ask, is he serious? You wonder if he'll engage, if he even identifies. What we were discussing, Sheila says, is whether we need another artist in the black community. How does that advance us? Well, Justin says. There's a hint of thoughtfulness in the way he speaks, or maybe in the pause just before. The artists are the heralds. They're our mirrors, our light. They reflect our reality, past, present, and future. Without them, we wouldn't have much gauge of whether we'd progressed or not. We'd be like children, groping for each other, in the dark. Naya laughs. Just great, Sheila says. A poet, you say. No, not really, Justin says. I'm a musical theater major, though. Tell me, mister. Musical theater, Sheila says, what can your musicals reveal that a census or a Pew report can't? Well, Justin begins again. He squints, and his jaw looks marginally stressed for a moment. He exhales slowly, as though he were releasing cigarette smoke. His jaw relaxes. His beauty marks dance around his face as he speaks. A census tells us the what, but not the why. But even if we have the why, let's say wealth disparities result from discriminatory housing. Practices, we still wouldn't have the humanity that's essential to conveying the real message. That human lives are at stake. Plus, factor in representation in a larger sense, you say. If I don't create characters who look like me, who will? Visibility is important. 
otherwise, it's as if we don't exist. Right, Justin says. Well, aren't you frick and frack? Naya says. You're a writer? Justin asks. I wonder if you wouldn't mind looking at a piece I've been working on. It could use another set of eyes. You meet Justin at a coffee house. You're meeting him so he can give you a copy of the story or play or script he's been working on. You're not too clear on those details. He's got it in hand when he greets you. This is the piece you wanted me to look at? He says yes, but keeps the manuscript on the table, beneath his folded arms. Thanks for agreeing to. He looks around the cafe. I've never been here. It's a nice choice. His fingertips flick the corners of the manuscript, giving it bunny ears. Sorry. I'm just a bit nervous. I suppose. How come? He shrugs and looks down at his hands. I've actually never done this kind of thing before. Listen, don't be nervous, you say. It can be awkward at first, putting yourself out there. Putting so much trust in someone else. Exposing yourself. I mean. We all worry about what people will think. It's only natural. But after the first time, it gets easier. You'll get used to it, and pretty soon you'll start to love it. I hope so, he says. He twists a silver ring around his pinky. Can I ask you something? I don't mean to be intrusive, but I'm curious. You might as well, at this point. Justin smiles. What's your background? He sits a bit straighter. Like, educationally? I mean where are your parents from? That's an odd question, Justin says. They're from here. As were their parents before them. Yeah, but I mean racially, you say. He stares at you in silence, looks around, faces you again. Do you have some kind of fetish or something? Fetish? I get it if you have a type, but, type? I'm not into the whole exotification thing. Type? What do you think this is? You stare at each other, each waiting for the other, to clarify things. I just came to read your story, dude. And help me expose myself? I meant creatively. I'm actually going to go now. Wait, you say. He hesitates a moment, hands poised to push himself up from the table. Can't we be friends? He laughs. I already have friends, he says. Besides, I think you have some issues you need to work through. In the final fall semester of your undergraduate career, you force yourself to stare into the fire red bursting in the leaves, to take in the breeze, crisp and invigorating along the skin poking out from your sweater, to tell yourself, this is magic. This doesn't happen where I'm from, I've come so far. In the blistering, skin-biting nights that follow, though, you wish only that you were back in Miami saturated by swampy warmth, engulfed in the sticky hot. But you are not in Miami. So you puff hot breaths into your scarf, to melt feeling back into your face. Tuck your head and lift your boots, trudge silently through the snow. In the midst of the first snowstorm of your final semester, before your kitchen's lights flicker to black and your cell loses its signal, you make a decision. You call your mother to tell her. I have news, you say, over the wind ripping at your living room window. The one missing the glass storm window. You press the meat of your palm into your left ear cavity and shout into the receiver, I'm moving home this summer. Right after graduation. I have news, your mother responds, her voice irritatingly soft. I'm moving home this summer. Right after graduation. The window frame shutters, and you wince away the idea that your mother is parroting you, that you've been away long enough for her to have grown senile. You are home, you say. No, she says. Kingston. Me get a job offer. You haven't lived there in thirty years, almost. It's time, she says. This place too hard for a black woman. Which black woman? This black woman. You feeling all right? You hang up and call your brother. Mom says she's black and that she's moving to Jamaica. Those might be signs of dementia. 
Your brother chuckles quietly, a sound affirming that he's never been particularly bothered by happenings in the lives of others. We all have to be what we have to be sometimes. You want to tell him where he can shove his platitude, to say, I didn't imagine this. This hasn't all been in my head. You nearly say, it must be nice to be welcome in the country you were born in, to have a homeland to escape to. You say, the connection's bad. I'll call you back. You dial your father. I'm coming home, you tell him. He pauses a long while, so long that you check the phone's display to confirm that he's still on the line. Trelawney, you think that's a good idea? You don't? Well, what you can do down here? There's no jobs. He reels off a list of keywords, seemingly excerpted from the evening news, mortgage crisis, foreclosures, recession, economic downturn. Better you just stay there, he says. I'll have my degree. That should help me find something. Degree in what? English? Then don't speak English here. How that can help you get job? Maybe I'll work with you. There's no work, he says. The people can keep the houses them have, much less build new house. Even your mother's house them foreclose on. They did? You think about her adjustable rate mortgage, about the bank doing the adjusting. Where you will live if you move back, your father asks. You fumble over the words, I'll figure it out. You say, listen. I'd better go, before you can succumb to the realization that his invitation to move in with him, the one that is more than a decade late, is not coming. A couple of months, before you graduate, before you load up your Dodge Raider and drive the 1,811 miles back to Miami to figure things out. You decide to take a DNA test. You spit into a tube, mail it, and await the findings. Six weeks later an email notifies you that your results are ready. You log into your account and a box pops up stating that you are 38% West African. This is your highest percentage from any single region, as large and varied as this region may be. This feels right, or at least it doesn't strike you as particularly wrong, given your Jamaican parentage and the history behind the populating of the island. But when you click to pull up your complete ancestral breakdown, the top of the page shows 59.9% European ancestry, British, mostly, with the smaller, broken-down percentages spanning the continent. The bottom of the page shows 1% Middle Eastern ancestry. The remainder is inconclusive. Holy shit, Katie says from beside you on the couch. She backs away so she can take you in anew. I'm dating a white boy. You, Negro, are mostly European. You're still black, Katie says, turning serious. This is the first concrete data you've been provided about your race, though it's actually closer to your ancestral ethnic makeup. Race, you know, is a social construct. It can't be measured, because it doesn't exist, biologically. If the results had shown 99% European and 1% African, as long as your skin held some degree of brown and your hair still coiled, you'd still be black and only black by American standards. You think of the times you're asked to check a box, on the census or an intake form at a doctor's office or a teaching evaluation at the end of the semester. It's one of the few times when you're asked to self-identify by an entity incapable of correcting or denying you, at least in that moment. You may now scrawl, a little of this and a little of that beside the other box, but this new information doesn't mean you should check black and white. First, the entire project of whiteness means to the exclusion of and. Second, you are not the progeny of a black person and a white person. You are the offspring of two others. You're brown, but not that kind, and not that kind, and not that kind. Black means expansive enough, inclusive enough, to contain the whole of your European ancestry, to bear the whole of the continent, you're French, you're Italian, you're Irish, you're English. And black, you're black, you're black, then why do they keep asking? You'd hoped that receiving scientific evidence would make easier the process of claiming one thing or embracing being multitudinous. Would empower you to say, regardless of what you see me as, I'm this. To say, I'm this. Regardless of what city or country or company I'm in. 
but nothing's changed. Not even the testing of your DNA can help you answer, in one irrefutable word, what are you?